Hey guys, welcome back to part two of my small series about finite differences for elliptic PDEs. In part two, we will deal with Neumann boundary conditions. But be before we hop into boundary conditions, let's do a short recapitulation of what we have done in the first part. In the first part, we started with the continuous problem, the negative a second, second derivative of a function u should equal a function f inside a given domain. And on the boundary, we have fixed values. So u of 0 should be u of 1, should be 0. We then used finite differences to tackle those second derivatives and ended up with a discretized problem, which you can see here. This is obviously a system of linear equations, which can be easily rewritten into a matrix vector multiplication, which you can see here. And in the end, we showed that this method or that this system can be tackled by numerical methods including splitting methods or the standard conjugate gradient method. If you have a partial differential equation and you impose fixed boundary values, as you can see here, we impose fixed values on the boundary, you usually call this a directly boundary condition. An interpretation of this that in the case of a membrane, this means that the membrane is fixed at the boundary, so here at x equals 0 and at x equals 1. And of course, in the numeric, um, the extension to other values than zero is of course straightforward. So keep in mind, conditions like this are usually called directly boundary conditions. And of course, you are not limited to this. Of course, there are more boundary conditions. There are a lot more than that. And next, more complex, you usually consider are the so-called Neumann boundary conditions. You do not change the PDE itself, but you now impose um, conditions on the derivative of the function u at the boundary. So at, at, uh, at, at 0 we impose or we, we want that u prime is equal to a value alpha and on the point x equals 1 it should be equal to a point equals beta. Um, if we assume that um, we want to model a heat distribution then this models a prescribed heat flux coming from the surface or here from left and from right to the boundary. Could also model the outflow depending on the on the um, sign of alpha and beta. And of course, this is um, um, straightforward to see because uh, the first derivative of a function u um, models the um, uh, the change of the function. Going back to school, you know how fast does a function or how fast does a function change its value? Well, you compute the first derivative. That's exactly what you, what, you, what you want to model here. However, if we formulate our problem like this, we have some problems. Because the problem itself it's, is not well posed, uh, the solution is not unique. It's easy, very easy to see. Let's assume that bar u is a solution to the problem above, so to the Neumann boundary problem. Then we can set a function v bar to be the function u bar u plus some constant we see some arbitrary chosen constant. Then you can easily check um, that v bar is also a solution to the equation above, to the problem above, because um, constant terms have derivative zero, or constant functions have, have derivatives zero. And of course, this means that the constant c drops out. Well, you can see the calculation here. Well. Um, the solution is not unique. And this is, a, this is a huge problem because you cannot just simply start discretizing the system itself because you will end up in a non-regular or in a singular matrix well, and you cannot solve the resulting system. How do we get around this issue? Well, we have to change the problem, unfortunately. And we do so by adding um, a term c times u, as you can see here. And for this problem, it's quite easy to see that the problem is unique if the, const, if, this, if the function c is bounded away from zero by, for instance, some value c0. This must hold true for all x inside of the domain. And uh, you will see also this later in the numerical approximation. You will see that if c is zero, the resulting matrix is singular. But if, zero, if c is bounded away from zero, um, the resulting matrix will be regular and we can solve our system. So in the following, we only consider this problem here. So we have the Laplace equation here plus some additional term and our Neumann boundary conditions. 
let's quickly recall the three most famous approximations of first order derivatives, the forward, backward and the central difference. In the first line you can see the forward um, difference, in the middle we have the backward difference and in the third line we have the central difference. As you can see here, the forward and the backward uh, difference are only of, uh, only of order, order 1, while the central difference is a second order approximation. So it would be actually quite reasonable to use the difference with the highest order, so the central difference, because we have second order, to approximate our Neumann boundary conditions. Um, however, this would lead to the, use, to the use of ghost points, or at least I call them ghost points. So ghost points for me are points which are outside of our domain. So let's go quickly through it. We want to approximate u prime of, uh, of zero. This would lead to the use of a point u minus one, which is, which, which is minus h. And then we have this approximation here. But however, u minus one is outside of, of the domain. So we want to deal um, only with points inside of the domain. Hence, we only use the forward difference to approximate our Neumann boundary conditions. However, keep in mind, it is still, as always, it's still possible to use the central difference, then you have to deal with more complexity of your, of your uh, system. So, as I just said, we only want points inside of the domain. Hence, we approximate uh, u prime with, with uh, forward difference, forward, uh, forward difference, and you can see the approximations here. And all we have to do now is we have to add these equations or these two, these two equations to our system. Let's start with the discretization of our partial differential equation. The blue part, so the um, uh, second derivative, is straightforward discretized uh, in the, into this part. This, was, this had been done in the first part of the series. And the green part, well, it's obviously just fi. You can see the abbreviations here. So fi is just f applied to xi and ui is just u applied to xi. And um, the new thing is the red part, but this is very easily um, uh, discretized. Well, c of x will, of course, be transformed to ci and ux will be transformed to ui. So nothing spectacular happens here. All we have to do now is to put this into a big matrix. And this is done in the next slides. You can see here there's a lot of white space here um, because we do it step by step. We start with the, um, with the second order terms of our partial differential equation. Um, well, this is just putting coefficients down in this matrix here. Um, this is done in the, well, this should, this should be not new. There's nothing new. The new stuff now comes here. Now we add our approximation of our normal boundary conditions. So this here, the right part of this equation is just an approximation of u prime at zero. And we put this into the first line of our matrix here. There's a small trick and I will, I will explain this trick to you and why I am doing this. Um, we put an artificial zero here on the right hand side. Um, First of all, don't be afraid about this h minus one. This is just to cancel out with the one over h square because we do only have one h here, so it's nothing spectacular. But we add an additional minus here to get uh, to switch around the sign of the coefficients here. Because if I just multiply this here, this line with this with this vector here, I would get um, u zero minus u one. But however, I want u1 minus u0, so it's just the other way, other way around. Um, but due to the, uh, the artificial zero here, this is the correct, the correct uh, form. Why am I doing this? Well, because I want our matrix to be symmetric. And you can see here, now we have um, a symmet symmetry here. The resulting matrix is symmetric. If I would not have done this, um, the minus would be on this side here and the resulting matrix would not be symmetric. And in the end, we want our matrix to be symmetric, positive, definite, from where we now can deduce the regularity. So similar for the approximation of uh, u prime at the point one, you can see the approximation here and we just added in the last line of the matrix. Here, we do not have to change the uh, sign of the coefficients because this is all this is directly in the, in the correct order. Okay, so all we are left now 
is the red is is with the additional red part. So this is the uh, um, c of x times mu of x part in the partial differential equation. But well, this is just an a, a, the artificial coefficient for the ui. So we just add them here on the diagonal. Um, the 8 squared cancel out with this 8 squared. And well, it's basically all we have to do now to get our, our discretized problem into a very big matrix. And now you will see why we want our function c to be bounded away from zero. Because if you ignore all those red parts, just set ci to be zero, and well, you can do it by hand for a small n, you will see that the matrix is singular. However, if ci is bounded away from zero, you can see that the matrix is positive definite. You can work around with um, um, diagonal dominance and something like this. Um, the symmetric symmetricity is easily be seen. And in the end, we know that our matrix AH is, is regular. Hence, the resulting system we want to solve has a unique solution. And this is what we wanted to achieve. So this is all you have to put into MATLAB or whatever your favorite language is, and you can solve the Neumann boundary Neumann, Neumann boundary problem. Let's have a few words on the accuracy of the scheme. This scheme uh, is only first order accurate um, in the in the in the L infinity norm. So this means that we, uh, if u bar is the exact solution of our system and u h is the approximation, we know that the um, LNF or the, the maximum norm behaves like uh, o of a big O of h. Um, why is that so? Because well, we could not, we cannot expect any more because we use third, first order approximations for our normal boundary conditions. The accuracy can be increased if we use a central difference scheme for our boundary conditions. In this case, we would achieve second order convergence or second order accuracy. However, as I mentioned before, this would lead to the use of ghost points, which would make the system a little bit more complicated. In the following, we want to construct an easy example. We are working on the domain 0 to, 0 to 1. We set alpha to be 1 and beta to be minus 1. And for simplicity, we set c to be constant 1. Our prototypical solution is uh, just a quadratic polynomial. Um, so a x squared plus bx plus c. And then the following, we want to find coefficients for a and b and c. Um, we use our Neumann condition. Um, uh, so alpha 1, which is uh, u prime at 0, and similar for u prime at 1, to get values for the coefficient of a and b. So a it turns out to be minus one and b turns out to be one. Um, we are left with the value c and with the value for f. So to get a value for f, we just uh, set f to be, well, we have to satisfy this equation. So, well, there we have a definition for f. Just plug everything in and we see that f um, has to satisfy this equation here. Um, we set now set c to be minus two to cancel out with this term here and we get f to be this nice function here. So it's just a straightforward calculation uh, of, a, of a, a example. Summarizing, the function minus x squared plus x minus 2 is the unique solution of this very nice Neumann boundary um, problem. This is now something we can compute because we can solve this numerically and we have the exact solution available here. And this allows us to compute the L infinity error norm. So here you can see uh minus, minus bar u um, in the double logarithmic error plot. Uh, on the x-axis we have n, so that n is the number of points. Um, and here we have the, uh, the error norm. You can see we have a line in the double logarithmic error plot indicating that we have a very nice rule. The question is, how can we find this rule or how can we numerically justify this rule? From theory, we are expecting that the error uh minus bar u in the infinite norm behaves something like big O of h, where h is something like 1 over n, to be precise, 1 over n minus 1. If we assume that this, um, that this uh, equation holds, we can 
Uh, we, we know that there exists a constant c, independent of h, this is important, something uh, such that these two equations hold. So u of h minus bar u and infinity is something like c times h. And if we replace h by h half, so if we decrease the grid size by a factor 2, well, there you go. Then we have uh, just replace h by h half and you have the, these two equations must hold. If we now compute the fraction of these two equations, we have now something we can actually compute. We have we know that the fraction of u h half minus bar u divided by u h minus u bar bar u must be something like one half, and this is now something we can numerically check. In a very roughly spoken manner, we know that this rule means if we decrease the grid size by a factor two the error in the in the uh, L infinity norm must also be decreased by a factor two and this is represented by this fraction here and this is of, this is very perfectly satisfied you can see the values here on in the first part of the table uh, in the first column of the table you have uh, n n double each each row um, so this roughly means that we half h so in every line h will be will be uh, multiplied by a factor will be divided by two here we have the um, values of the uh, L infinity error norm and here we have the fraction and this fraction should converge to well <laughs> to one over two so to one half this is of course this is very super perfectly satisfied so our theory um, although I did not prove it seems to be correct and this is um, this is supported by our numerical experiments. This is now the end of part two of this of the second part of this small series. I hope you learned something about discretization of Neumann boundary conditions. If you want to learn more, as I always said, grab a good book and um, take a look into it. This is way more, they can explain it way better than I can do it. And it's way more in, in detail and in depth than I can present it here. In the next part, we will deal with the upwind discretization, meaning that we are looking at the more complex components of the partial differential itself. Until then, have fun, take care and see you.